Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Um, this morning we're looking at reference materials and appropriate resources for different purposes. So including to find the meaning of words in straightforward and complex sources. So our aims and outcomes today are that by the end of this session, you must be able to use some reference materials and resources, such as glossaries, keys and legends, visual aids, and also use them to find word meanings in different text types. You should be able to use a range of reference materials and resources, such as glossaries, keys, legends, visual aids, footnotes, and endnotes. And you could identify primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. So, if you don't understand a word or a phrase while you are reading a text, what would you do? So, can you suggest anything you could do if you needed to understand a word or phrase? So you're reading a news story and you come across a word, you're not sure of the meaning and it doesn't, the sentence or the story doesn't make sense because you don't know the meaning of the word, what would you do? So can anyone suggest something they might do if they didn't understand a word or a phrase? So it's, re it's really, if you've got a smartphone or if you're using a, a tablet, it's really easy um, and a computer to um, find the meaning of a word. Um, but there's also other ways to do it if you read if you're reading a text that's um a book or a, a magazine a newspaper there are other ways you can find out the meaning how could you find out the meaning where could where could you go for help what could you do um i'll go for go to google to yep. find the meaning of the word. Excellent. So really simple these days. We can just Google something we don't understand. So a word or a phrase, put it into Google and find an answer. Um, if you're reading a text on a smartphone or a tablet, as I said, you can double click on the word and it will pop up, look up. And again, it will it will search. It will do like a Google search or an internet search for that word. How about if you, uh, not electronically? So um, maybe cast your mind back to when you were younger. If any of you are, are the same age as me, a bit older, before smartphones and tablets. It may be when you were at school. If you didn't understand a word, what would the teacher tell you to go and look in? A uh, dictionary. Excellent, yeah, of course, a dictionary. So there are different ways that we can help ourselves to find the meanings of words or phrases that we don't understand. So you've already come up with some, but there's some others there. So Wikipedia, you could ask a friend, thesaurus. Um, we, we mentioned looking on the internet using a dictionary. You could also check the footnotes or the glossary of the text if there is one or use the key. And we're going to look at those this morning. So in text references. So within a text that you are reading, there might be in text references. And these are features such as those listed mm -hmm. here, a glossary, mm -hmm. a, term, okay. a legend or key visual aids, footnotes, and endnotes. So you might know what some or all of those are, but 
we're going to look at those together now. So a glossary. So it's a term, it's a, a glossary of terms is a list of terms. So a list of definitions in a special subject, field or area of usage and often got accompanying definitions. So you'll often find them in non-fiction type texts. Um, we've got an example here, which is some instructions, or it might also be called a manual. Um, and also in subject specific books. So if you were interested, for example, in learning about um, plants. So I, I got a plant for Christmas and it's a bonsai tree. I know nothing about bonsai trees, so I've bought a book and in the book there is a glossary of terms. So those sorts of information, non-fiction books or manuals are where you most commonly see a glossary. So um, I'm going to read it out. You can follow on your own screen. The front side of the oak drawer was more than three times as long as the height of the side panels that I was planning to make. So I decided to use that to make the adjacent panels, readying the wood by unscrewing and removing the two drawer handles, gently knocking the drawer apart with a driving baton, quite easy, as it was only held together with dove joints, hacksawing the wood to length, measuring from both ends to make the cut so that both pieces retained the dove joints. Placing a mason square above the dove joints, marking a straight line and using a handsaw, cutting down to the depth of the dove joints. Using a chisel to bang out the dove joints, leaving a near perfect half joint almost the same depth as the thickness of the shelf. So, um, the writer is explaining how they um, they made, I think they're making some, or, or un, um, taking apart some drawers. And often for glossaries, often the words or phrases that are in the glossary, where they appear in the text, they are a different colour as you can see here on the screen, or they might be in bold, just to highlight to the reader, so to yourself, that you are able to go and look those up in the glossary. So just to aid your understanding. So any questions about glossaries? Okay. Okay, a key. So the most common place a key is seen is on a map. So if you've ever looked at a map, um, then you will see a key and it gives you more information about symbols on the map. The legend explains how to use the key. So for example, here we have a picture of a map and there are lots of these blue um, symbols with numbers on and white circles with numbers on. The numbers are different, but the symbol stays the same. So the legend explains why that is and how to use it. So it tells us that the um, these are the highways of California and the numbers are examples. So on the map, that shows you the number of the road. So this is an American map on a British map or a map of um, Britain, similar map. It might show you the motorway numbers. In the key, it would just give you an example number, but on the map, the motorways would all be different numbers. So... That's just an example that you might be familiar with or most people would be familiar with, but also you might find keys on charts or diagrams. 
So um, to ex it just helps your understanding of a visual aid or shows you how to use it. So in a text, as well as the visual aid just appearing, so if you have a map, it may be that you just have a standalone map and the key will help you understand how to use the map. But you might also find um, visual aids such as um, photographs, pictures, charts and diagrams or maps in within a text. So there's an example here. We've got um, an extract of a text and a map next to it. So I'll read out the text. You can read along and then it will become clear why there is a map there. Riding coast to coast in three days with Alan Smithick. Age 40, overweight and single, I decided to turn my life around. A work colleague suggested getting in training to do the annual Old Sussexonians 104 mile three day trip from Whitard in Essex to Winchelsea on the Sussex coast. The route, as pictured on the right, involved a mix of rural beauty and London chaos. It was to change my life. So the route is pictured um, next to the text and shows the route of this three um, day trip that he is taking. So it allows the reader to visualize and understand what the writer, um, what they are writing about. Okay, so moving on to footnotes. These appear at the bottom of pages of text and refer to other sources of information. They can be direct quotes, summaries or paraphrasing. And they may be very detailed. So you can find footnotes in any type of text. Um, you sometimes see them in fiction, such as novels, but you more often see them in non-fiction text. So it could be a textbook, an academic text, um, an article, and so on. So if you have um, done previous study, then you may well have seen footnotes in some of the academic reading that you have done. So here we've got a detailed footnote. It has been argued over and over again that one should pronounce scone a certain way. And then you can see there's a little number one. So if we cast our eyes down to where the one is underneath, or if this was in a book or in a um, journal, magazine, then that would be at the bottom of the page. And where that little one is, it says, John Lamb, perfect pronunciation from Augment to Xanthip. Cumberland, WordPress 1990, pages 78 to 90. So that footnote is explaining where the argument has come from. So it's been argued over and over again. And the author is then using that footnote to tell us where that argument has come from. Or an example of this. So, however, Neville has recently produced conclusive evidence that it should really be pronounced one way, claiming the original Scottish is with a long O as in toast, scone. So that would be, that's what it's telling us. And then it's got a little number two. So again, we can look down and we can see that this quote comes from the author Sheila Neville, Words in History, London, Green, 2007, pages 56 to 62. So the reference or the footnote refers to the author, title, publisher, the year of publication and the pages the information is from. 
So it's telling you that you can get further information if needed or if you want to from that source. So the footnotes give sources for information or quotations in the text you are reading. So any questions so far? Okay. So end notes, these are the same as footnotes, but they are often highly detailed. So rather than being at the bottom of a page of text where they might take up an awful lot of space on the page, they would go at the end of the text. So at the back of the book, for example. So as I've said, they're often highly detailed and where multiple pages are using lots of reference notes or if the notes are very long, it might be better to use an end note just to, um, just to have continuity in the text so it's not we haven't got you know one paragraph on a page and the rest is is footnotes and it's you know it's taking up all that space it's just um more organized in that case where there's a lot of information in the footnotes to make them end notes instead and put them at the back of the text so such as at the back of the book so We've talked about these terms, footnote. Um, so it could be something has been paraphrased. So we've got two footnotes there. So paraphrase and we've got footnote direct quote. And um, before we have a go at that little activity, if we look here, we've got a paraphrase here. It has been argued over and over again that one should pronounce scone or scone a certain way. So it's a paraphrase and that is an example number one. And so that paraphrasing needs a footnote. There's a direct quote here, the original Scottish, and that is footnote number two. So the original quote, uh, the, we've got the quotation marks or speech marks around that. You can see here, uh, oh, sorry. Just before the two, we've got those little speech marks and at the start as well. So footnotes, they can either be uh, used for paraphrasing or a direct quote. So we've got some examples here of um, reference references and then an explanation of what that is. So a glossary. So would you find, a, a, um, so where would you find it or what would you need to understand it? Okay. So footnote, glossary, visual aid, key or a footnote. So all of these things we've just, we've, I've just told you about and they are used to aid the reader's understanding. OK. So first of all, a visual aid. So a visual aid is a, a picture, a map, a graph or a chart. So can anyone see a visual aid on the left? So any of these items, a visual aid on the left. Which one is a visual aid? So you can tell me whereabouts it is in the table. Okay, so I'll, I'll help you with this one. So the visual aid is here. So we've got bar chart. So this would help explain possibly some um, statistics or numerical information. Okay, so we'd find that. Okay, so we'd find 
a visual aid to help us. Okay, so glossary. So can anyone see an example of something that might appear in a glossary? So remember a glossary um, will give us definitions. So can you see on this side here, oops, sorry, um, something that looks like a definition? So it's defining um, a word that might be difficult to understand. So we know it's definitely not going to be um, this one here. That's not a glossary. So that is something different. Does anyone know what this is? Whether it's a footnote, a key, what do you think? This one here where I've put the X. What type of reference material would we call this? So we've got some symbols here and we've got some um, names for those symbols to help us. Is so that a key? It is a key. Thank you. Thank well you. done. So that's a key. My mouse isn't working very well. Hold on. So we'd find that. Where would you find a key? Can you give me an example? Can you remember what we looked at together? Where would we find a key usually? Or where most people would have seen one? On the map. On a map, yeah, well done. So for glossary, we're looking for a definition. So we've got feral protective cover on end of walking stick. The rise in crime, that's supposed to be, is proportional to the increase in poverty. Or... All changes were due to the decline in traditional forms of mail. So a glossary will be a definition. Does anyone want to have a go at which one will be a definition? So imagine you see a word in the dictionary and then an explanation. I, I, I will say the rise, in, the rise in crime is a proportional to the increase in proverb, poverty. Okay, so if we have a look here, so that's, mm. it's got, it's only got one, but it's got quotation marks here or inverted commas, we sometimes call them speech marks as well. So it's got them here and here. Mm. Okay, so if we've got a quote, then in fact, it, we've got a big clue here quote it's going to be a footnote so to understand where that or to refer to where that's come from we're going to need to look at the footnote to find out whose words those are so the proportional to the increase in poverty who said that we would be looking at the footnote so there'd be a little number there after it and then we'd look to the bottom find the number and the footnote OK, so the glossary, this is from the glossary. OK, so this is a definition. I don't know what the word is that it's explaining, if I'm honest, but it's explaining a word from the text that is a protective cover on the end of a walking stick. OK, so that means the final one. All changes were due to the decline in traditional forms of mail. So it is tricky, this activity, 
because we're just getting a sentence. It's not within the text, so it wouldn't make more sense then, possibly if we had um, a paragraph and we had to pick these out instead. An, an actual example of text might make this easier. But um, someone is paraphrasing here. All changes were due to the decline in traditional forms of mail. So what you might find in a book is there's a little number one there. Oh, sorry. That's my um, mouse not working very well. So number one, and then you would go to the bottom of the page and you'd see number one and there would be an explanation of where the writer found that argument or information that they have paraphrased. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? It is tricky, that, that activity. Okay. Let's So types of sources. So a writer can use a source from anywhere to inform the text they are writing. And they're split into three types. And we've got some examples here of those three types of sources. So a primary source is a first-hand source. So it's the original idea or thought. So a primary source, examples are novels. So the idea of a novel, so a story, it's straight from the writer's mind and they've written it down. Okay, a diary is a first-hand account of somebody's um, life experience. They've kept a diary. It's it's the it's their own ideas. Again, a bit like with the story, it's straight from their mind. They've written it down. And an interview. So somebody is interviewed about their life, for example, um, about an experience they've had. The interview is a primary source because, again, those answers, somebody explaining their experience, it's straight from their own mind. Okay, so they're primary sources. A secondary source is an interpretation and evaluation of sources. So, articles, biographies. So, to explain this, a secondary source use uh, would use primary sources so because it's using a primary source it then becomes secondary so for example an article somebody wants to write an article about um i don't know let me think of an example so somebody wants to write an article about a famous footballer um, they would, first of all, go and read any interviews, diaries, any, uh, maybe even other articles about that footballer. They do their research. In that article, they might use quotes from interviews that that footballer has previously given. So the primary source is used it's interpreted and then it's used in as a second um it's a secondary source then so that article that's written using a primary source that article is now secondary okay so the information first occurred in an interview and then that information's been interpreted and written about in an article so that's now a secondary source so moving on to 
uh, tertiary sources or third sources. These are collections of primary and secondary source. So if we look at this textbook, some wikis there, if we think of wikis, so um, that may use both. So if we were thinking of um, a footballer again, um, on that wiki, there might be information that comes from direct interviews that that footballer has given, but also information that comes from articles written about the footballer as well. So it's using both primary and secondary sources. And so that's then a tertiary source, a third source. Okay. Does that make sense? Do, does anyone have any questions about different types of sources, primary, secondary and tertiary sources? Okay. Okay. okay, so we're going to review what we've looked at this morning in our quiz. So what is an incorrect way to look up a word? Is it incorrect to look in a dictionary, in a glossary, online, or is there not an incorrect way? Can we use all of those? What do you think? OK, so for the quiz, I do need you to contribute and then we can review our learning. So what do you think? Is there an incorrect way to look up a word? So you can just unmute yourself. So if you if you. Are, reading a text and there's a word you don't understand is it okay to look it up in a dictionary is it okay to look at a glossary is it okay to look online yeah it's it's okay. yeah so you could look up or you could sorry you could use all of those ways so the yeah. answer would be d there's no incorrect way uh we could use all of those ways to look up a word So, so as it says there, to help us, different methods are better for different sources, but there isn't a wrong way. So if you were reading a manual and a set of instructions, it may be there's a glossary. And so that would be the best place to look. But it it's still OK to look online or look in a dictionary. Sometimes there's a better way, but all of those ways are okay, and that's fine. There isn't a wrong way. Well done. Whoops. So which of the following <clears throat> is not a reference tool? So which of these have we not looked at this morning? A key, a footnote, a back note, a glossary, or an end note? So which of those is not something we've talked about this morning? OK, so just unmute yourself so that we've got five people in the session. So I'd like to hear some contributions so that I know that you have understood. And you've taken on board uh, what you've looked at? Back note. A back note, good. So it's just put that in as a bit of a trick, really, because we've got footnotes and endnotes there. Footnotes at the bottom of the page, endnotes at the end of the text, but a back note is not one of those things we've looked at. So where would you most likely see a glossary? What type of text? An instruction manual, an email, a newspaper article, or an advert. So a glossary. Remember, that's like a mini dictionary just for that text to tell you 
um, meanings of words in that text, a glossary. So where would you find it? So let's go through them then one by one, if you're not sure. So an instruction manual, do you think you'd see a glossary in that type of text? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, well done. So it helps to define unusual or technical words or terms. So an instruction manual particularly might include technical words. Um, so. An example might be um, how to um, fix a washing machine. There might be a manual, so there might be technical words to do with the different parts of that machine. So it would have a glossary then to help you understand them. Well done. So we've got a glossary here in the blue box for the rules of chess. Which of these is an abbreviation? So an abbreviation is um, letters or words that are short for something else. C. Good. So Katie, and we can look at the glossary here, and Katie, it's the middle one in the glossary, short for a knight or a piece, a chess piece. Good. Which of the following defines an aggressive move? So we need to look at all of these. So it's the same list here. Which of the definitions in this glossary includes words that would describe aggression? So a player's first rank. Nothing there about aggression or anger or anything aggressive. Bullet chess, a version of the game where players only have one minute per move. Nothing aggressive there. Short for night, we've already said that's an abbreviation. Mobility, the ability of a piece to move around the board. So moving around the board doesn't sound aggressive. A skewer, an attack on a valuable piece. So does that sound aggressive? Yeah. yeah. So it's skewer, it's E. So in that question, it doesn't give us an exact answer because it doesn't say aggressive in any of these definitions. So we we'll, we'll found a word that could be used to describe aggression and attack. So it's E, skewer. So which of the below shows a piece's ability? So what it can do. G. Good. Mobility. Because in there it says ability. So it tells us the ability of a piece to move around the board. So ability, what something or somebody can do. And it can move around the board. Good. So, moving on, if you saw this symbol on a map, what do you think it would represent? So, this little picture here, what do you think that would represent? A mosque, a hospital, a wildlife reserve, or a place of historical interest? Mosque. So, a mosque. So, does that pitch, little picture look like... A mosque. Um, mosque it's like mosque, mosque. So it it could be it could be a number of those. I think we'd all agree it's probably not going to represent a wildlife reserve, but the other ones it could be. So it it could be depending how you see this, it could be a mosque, a wildlife, uh, a hospital, or a place of historical interest. It is actually a place on a map, that picture there, that little symbol represents a place of historical interest. Um, but it could be 
a few of those like you've suggested but as it says here if you were given a question in an assessment like that you would have a key so we've looked at keys today and the key would tell you so you wouldn't need to guess it would tell you what the symbol means okay so what kind of source would an article usually be so would it be primary secondary or tertiary or none of the above so reading a magazine article um the example i gave before about um a footballer is that primary secondary or tertiary Secondary. Good. Secondary. So if it said an interview with a footballer, then that would be primary because it would be the, the answers to the interview questions. So the answers the footballer, as an example, would give are, are the answers straight from his mind. So that's primary. But because this says an article, um, it doesn't say an interview or then it would be secondary because the article has been written using other sources. Okay, so well done, that is secondary. So what kind of source would you expect a novel to be classed as? Well, primary good so it's a story that's been written straight from someone's mind it's primary source okay so our aims and outcomes you can see there does anybody have any questions okay if you um you should all have a moodle login if you don't, you can contact the office uh, during the week and ask for that. But when you log on, it will show you the courses that you're studying and there'll be um, support material there. So you can go online and do um, activities related to what we have looked at today to practice. But I'll just repeat what I say after every lesson. And the best way to practice is to read whenever you can. And I know everybody is really busy. So I always say if you're on the bus or the train or the tram or even you just get five minutes um, where you're waiting for something, waiting for the kettle to boil or whatever, have a quick look at a news story on your phone or um different types of texts over the week and just look for those features that we have talked about today and in previous sessions. So just be looking all the time. Oh, yes, I recognise um, that type of text. That's an article. Oh, an article's a secondary um, source. Can you see any other features? You're reading a newspaper. There's a story with numerical information and there's um, a graph there. There's a visual aid. So just all the time, every chance you get to read, just practice by looking for the features and um, that will just help your understanding of what we are learning in our sessions. OK, well, thank you very much. And I hope some of you are going to join me for our writing session tomorrow morning. Excuse me. Yep. Uh, can you the tertiary? I didn't understand well, sorry. So tertiary. Yeah. So let, let's just go back. Oh, my mouse isn't working very well today. Okay. So if you um went on, so have you ever used Wikipedia? So have you ever looked up um somebody's name on wikipedia hello 
So the person that asked the question about tertiary sources. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Have, you ever, have you ever used Wikipedia for anything? Just uh, maybe one time only. Okay. So if you go, so just as an example, if you yeah. went on Wikipedia, mm -hmm. um, then you, that would be a tertiary source. So the information on Wikipedia, so say you looked up, um, I don't know, King Charles. You look yeah. up on Wikipedia, they would be information um, from articles that had been written about him, biographies. So all that information mm -hmm. that's listed on Wikipedia would mm -hmm. be from secondary sources, such as articles. And yeah. it, it might also give you some um, quotes that he's, things that he said from interviews. So it's the, it's writing about a secondary source. Okay. Okay. So a secondary source is a text that has used a primary source. Okay. And a tertiary source is using secondary sources and, and or primary. Uh, well, it might use primary sources as well, but secondary sources. So a textbook. So you're studying um, biology at school, you've got a textbook, and in that textbook it would have information that is based on secondary sources, secondary. So articles that have been written about um, plants or animals, and yeah. then all of that information, all of those secondary sources are used mm -hmm. to um, write a a tertiary source okay so secondary sources are written using primary sources and tertiary sources are written using secondary sources okay okay yeah thank you. yeah does that make sense yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah. thank okay. you good question you're welcome okay yeah. so hopefully i will see you tomorrow have a good day everybody Okay, send to you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.